Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be turning our attention towards community corrections and we will see what is involved when offenders are released from prison and returned to the community under supervised release. Additionally, we will discuss what occurs when offenders are only sentenced to some community correction supervision. Let's go ahead and get started. We have already looked at institutional corrections and what life is like living inside a prison. When we are talking about community corrections, we're talking about life outside a prison, but still under the supervision of the state. Community corrections is really a gen generic term for programs that are controlled by local, state, and federal governments. There are local supervisors who oversee the offenders living in a specific area. Community-based programs have a connection to a central authority and a strong link to the surrounding community. They are meant to keep the offender living in the community that he or she comes from and to work to make amends for the crime that was committed. Offenders can be placed in diversion programs which, really in short, offer the offender a chance to avoid formal prosecution provided that the individual abides by the conditions of the diversion program. More traditional community correction programs include things like restitution, probation, parole, halfway houses, and furlough programs. We'll talk about these all individually throughout the lecture. When we think about corrections, institutional corrections are probably the first thing that comes to mind. We envision a large prison that is guarded by barbed wire and it's full of hardened prisoners. But realistically, the community correction programs are more important of the, are the more important of the two rather, given the sheer numbers of, of offenders who are under supervised release. At the end of 2011, approximately 5 million adults were on either probation or parole, comparative to the 2 million who were sentenced to jail or prison. If we had all 7 million people inside of prison, we would have to build so many more facilities in order to contain them all. Most of the individuals on community corrections are lower risk individuals, or those who have already served their incarceration sentences. Without community correction programs, we would have so many more people incarcerated for crimes that incarceration sentences are probably inappropriate for. The majority of these offenders have been sentenced to probation. Probation is a sentence, much like an incarceration sentence. Offenders are required to be under probation supervision for a certain period of time and have certain requirements that they must comply with. A probation officer oversees the supervision of the offender. A probation agency really has three fundamental objecti objectives. One, they are required to assist the court in matters pertaining to sentencing. Two, they promote community protection by supervising and monitoring the activities of all persons on probation. And finally, they promote the betterment of offenders by ensuring that they receive appropriate rehabilitation services. This is a table from the textbook addressing the amount of people who are on probation throughout the country for the year 2013. If you remember back to earlier chapters of the textbook and earlier lectures, these are also the states with the largest prison populations. Probation looks a bit different depending on where you are serving your sentence and who you are serving your sentence with, meaning with either local, state, or federal government. Probation is administered in, in different ways in different jurisdictions. The federal government administers its own probation system under the administrative office of the courts. Some states administer probation at the state levels, others at the local level. But no matter who is overseeing your probation sentence, there are a few types of probation that can occur. You could be sentenced only to probation, and that's all the punishment that you will receive. You can also have a suspended sentence. This is similar to diversion in that if you comply with all of the court-ordered requirements, then the judge will suspend your incarceration sentence. Split sentences occur when you go to jail or prison and then are sentenced to probation post-release. Both sentences must be delivered at the time of sentencing in court. This is not the same thing as parole where you are allowed to serve the remainder of your prison sentence back in the community. Here you first serve your entire prison sentence and then you begin your probation sentence. Shock probation occurs when the offender serves a short sentence in prison or jail 
and then serves the remainder of the sentence on probation. Finally, residential probation occurs when the individual serves their probation sentence in a halfway house or in a work release program rather than living in their own home. A probation sentence can be viewed as a process with three basic stages. First, there is the placement of an offender on probation by a judge. Next, supervision and service delivery for the probationer by the probation officer occurs. And finally, you have the termination of the probation if all of the conditions are met and the probationer does not violate the conditions set forth by, set forth by the court. Before an offender is sentenced to an incarceration sentence or even a community supervision sentence, a pre-sentence investigation must take place. A pre-sentence investigation is an investigation conducted by a probation agency or another designated authority at the request of a court, which looks into the past behavior of the offender, into their family circumstances, and also looks at the personality of an adult who has been convicted for a crime in order to assist the court in determining the most appropriate sentence for the individual. This happens for everybody who has to be sentenced, no matter what the sentence is that you are facing. We have also already discussed PSIs or PSRs once before earlier in the semester and we reviewed how a sentencing grid works. But when a PSI occurs and probation is the result, the PSI reveals certain useful criteria for the probationers. First, it tells us whether or not counseling would be a good fit for the offender and what type of treatment would be helpful. It also gives us a baseline so that we know what to expect from the probationer. If the individual has behaved a certain way in the past, it is very likely that they will behave that way again in the future. Probation sentences are pretty standard for the type of crime that occurs. If you commit a misdemeanor, then you will only be on probation for a shorter amount of time compared to, to if you have committed a felony. But typically, you should expect to be on probation for several years at a time, and you will have to pay restitution to your victim, among other probation conditions. Probation conditions are rules that specify what an offender is and is not allowed to do during the course of their probation sentence. There are two types of probation conditions. First, you have standard or general conditions that apply to all persons who are on probation. Standard conditions include things like maintaining employment, reporting to your probation officer, and maintaining a stable residence. Second, there are special conditions that are imposed at the discretion of the judge and the probation officials. They are designed to address the offender's particular situation. For example, if you are on probation for child pornography, then you would not be allowed internet access, you would not be allowed to have any internet capable devices, and you may not be allowed to have unsupervised visitation with children. If you're a drug offender, then you will have to come in for drug tests and you'll probably have to go to counseling or rehabilitative services. If the probationer does everything correctly, abides by the probation conditions, and does not violate them, then the probation officer will recommend that the probation sentence be terminated at the end of a specifically allotted amount of time. However, some of the conditions that probationers receive are so extensive that many individuals do violate the terms of their probation. Often probation agents will give warnings or will tighten probation conditions for minor crimes or technical violations. Technical violations occur when the offender does not comply with the conditions set forth by the judge and the probation officer, such as those that we mentioned earlier. When the probationer does not comply, a revocation can occur. This means that the judge repeals a probation sentence or a parole sentence and substitutes a more restrictive sentence because a violation of probation or parole conditions. One of the easiest ways for a probationer to be revocated is failing to pay their probation fees or their restitution. This is really a catch-22 if you think about it. Most individuals on probation now have a criminal record, which makes employment very difficult to obtain and maintain. But they are still expected to have a job or to be revocated, 
Additionally, they need, they need the job to pay their fees and their restitution, or they will be revocated. If they are revocated, then their probation sentences are further extended, and they have more fees to pay, but still cannot afford. However, despite all of this circular logic, there has been an increased call for probationers to pay more of their own supervision costs. It is anticipated that they should be able to afford the fees since the cost of probation is so much less expensive than incarceration costs. But no matter how inexpensive probation may be, comparative to incarceration, there are still probationers who cannot afford the cost of probation due to their indigent nature. One of the other large issues associated with probation is the amount of probationers that are overseen by an individual probation officer. This is known as caseload. Large caseloads promote recidivism because of the inability of probation officers to provide su sufficient supervision and services. Smaller caseloads actually inflate recidivism numbers because of great, greater scrutiny that is placed on the individual probationer's activities. So either way, you're running into caseload problems. It sounds like caseloads have to be somewhere in the middle, but what is the right number for different probation officers to have where they are not overwhelmed by the number of probationers on their caseload, but don't have so much free time that they can nitpick on each individual offender? For several reasons, it's difficult to determine how effective probation is in controlling recidivism. One of those reasons rests in how deciding to define recidivism. Is it in technical violations? Is it in new arrests? Is it in new convictions? This leads to problems in, actual, in accurately determining whether it is the probation experience or some other additional factor that is responsible for recidivism. Research suggests that probation is less effective than many people would like in curtailing re-arrest for felony offenders. Recidivism figures associated with probation do not seem substantially higher or lower than those associated with incarceration. Next, we have to turn our attention to parole. Parole is a method of prison release where inmates are released at the discretion of a parole board or other authority before having completed their entire prison sentence. This is not a separate sentence like probation is, but instead, parolees are released from prison early and are allowed to serve the remainder of their original prison sentence while living in the community. Parole can also refer to the community supervision received upon release. There are also important differences between probation and parole to consider. Parole rules and conditions are commonly more stricter than those of probation. Officers tend to be less tolerant of violations committed by parolees and that often results in more revocations. When parolees are revocated, they get sent back to prison to serve out the remainder of their sentence rather than just going for, to jail for a short spell. Parolees often face greater adjustment problems once they return to the community as well. When parolees are released, it often happens one of two ways. First, they can be released straight from prison and are allowed to return home. They can live in their own residence while under parole supervision. Otherwise, they are required to report to a halfway house or to a work release program where they reside while they're under parole supervision. Residential parole is used for higher risk offenders who have a greater chance of revocating or who might have difficulties being back in, commun in the community post-incarceration. Either way, parole is meant to serve as a way to one, provide community extra safety measures, two, promote offender betterment and reintegration into society, three, relieve and contain prison overcrowding, and finally, it's used to control the behavior of prison inmates. This table shows the number of people released on parole at the end of 2011. Like we discussed before, these numbers are similar to the probation and incarceration numbers in states with similarly large populations. It makes a lot of sense that California would be a state with a high parole population, as their incarceration is very, incarceration rates rather, are very high due to things like three strikes legislation and determinate sentencing practices. It is helpful to divide parole administration into two areas, 
First, the parole board is responsible for release decisions. Second, the field agency service is responsible for supervision in the community. As with probation, there are many differences between states in the way the parole is administered, in its organization, and even in its level of autonomy. Besides helping establish the jurisdiction's parole policies, the parole board is generally responsible for managing parole release processes and making decisions to terminate parole supervision. Parole boards can release an inmate in one of two ways. With discretionary parole, the parole board decides whether or not an inmate is eligible for release based on good behavior, whether or not there are any disciplinary issues, based on victim testimony, the type of offense, and whether or not the inmate has done anything to better himself while incarcerated. If discretionary parole is denied, the inmate then goes back to his cell and continues on with his prison sentence and serves it from inside the facility. Mandatory parole forces the parole board's hand. After a certain period of time, the parole board is almost forced to release the inmate from prison so that the inmate can serve the rest of their sentence while living in the community. The parolee can still be revocated and sent back to prison, but the parole board, before the parole board rather, this is the only option for when the prison sentence is nearly complete. You might notice from, from the slide that not all states actually have parole. In 1984, parole was officially abolished at the federal level when mandatory minimum sentencing went into effect. A lot of states followed the federal government's lead and abolished parole at the state level as well. Even for those states that still have parole, parole is not extended to all offender types. It is very difficult to be released on parole in a lot of places, and it largely still exists for those who were grandfathered in, meaning that they were sentenced before parole was abolished. Increasingly, parole agencies are using parole guidelines. There is, a, there is a certain structure to being released on parole. Parole guidelines are structured instruments that are used to estimate the probability of parole recidivism and to direct the release decisions of parole board members. Parole authorities consider a variety of factors in determining whether to grant parole, particularly the following factors, and these are listed in the order of importance. They focus on the crime severity, the crime type, the offender's criminal history, the number of victims involved in the crime, and the age of those victims. Parole revocation is also the responsibility of the parole board and that can occur in response to new crimes or technical violations. As with probation, parole officers enjoy considerable discretion as to when they decide whether or not to recommend a revocation for violations. Finally, over the years, there have been many criticisms to the use of parole. Many of these criticisms were instrumental arguments for the abolishment of parole at the federal level and for many states as well. One argument for the use of parole is easing prison overcrowding. We still have high amounts of prison overcrowding, which forces states to release prisoners by the thousands in some instances. But others have stated that if we continue to release inmates on parole, then we are risking the public safety. And admittedly, there have been cases where parolees have been released and have committed some pretty heinous crimes shortly after their release. These parolees were sentenced for, for their new crimes and won't be released on parole anytime soon. There are additional programs to consider when we discuss community corrections, such, such as intermediate sanctions and intensive supervision. Your book goes into great detail regarding these programs. I chose to focus more on probation and parole because they are the most widely used forms of community corrections and they are the classic programs. In this lecture, we discuss some of the benefits and some of the problems with each type of program, but also why they're necessary to keep around despite the issues that they present. Meet me back here next time when we pick up on chapter 13 and we discuss the juvenile justice system. Have a great day, everyone.